hey everybody welcome back to episode number three of stacked pod uh we're excited to sit down today with a couple of industry leaders in ticket sales uh, i'm chris highland director of business development for stacked sports ben graves my well-rested CEO, who's been in Greece for three weeks, is back finally today. Ben, hello. Good to see you again. What's We've got up? Ross with Learfield Ticket Solutions and Andrew with the Chicago Blackhawks with us today. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. We cannot wait to get into some ticket sales discussions today. How are you both doing? Fantastic. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Absolutely. doing great. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, absolutely, guys. We're happy to have both of you. Uh, Andrew, what are things like uh, in Chicago there? You guys have been making some big waves. Uh, free agency, you got a nice new goalie there we saw. Marc-Andre Fleury coming to the Hawks. What's the what's it been like in the office there? Yeah, it's, you know, it's huge news when you get a name like that and, you know, future Hall of Famer, multi-Stanley Cup winner. It just definitely puts some wind behind our sails. It's great for our reps. We have something great to push. And obviously for the team on the ice here, it's, uh, you know, it's starting to come together. We've, we've missed the playoffs for the past few years. It's been tough, you know, kind of working through that after such a great, you know, run 10, 13, 15 cups, but we're, uh, I'm hoping we're back, you know, we're really excited and we're uh, getting after selling our partial plans actually starting next week. So a lot of, a lot of good stuff happening over here. And you're a guy who's been here through all that success. Strategically. Yeah, I've been here. Go Sorry. ahead, Ben. I was just going to say, strategically, how do you leverage that? You know, we, we, try to, we try to put marketing pieces together that, you know, reflect some of that excitement. So I think we try to be proactive where we basically have, we have a strategy built around free agency and around that trade deadline where if something big happens, we're, we're ready to capitalize on it. And we work hand in hand with our marketing team to, you know, kind of structure that strategy based on these types of, uh, you know, big moves that are going to come most summers. Sure. Ross, free agency, not something you have to deal with on the college side. <laughs> not, not really. We do have the transfer portal, but not, yeah, not, not, not quite the same. We know all too well about the transfer portal, right? I mean, the coaches that we work with on the recruiting side, man, that takes up a ton of time now. So kind of like free agency, right? I mean, but there's got to be other um, uh, touch points or, or uh, milestone moments in the collegiate ticket sales side of things that you guys try and leverage too, I would assume, right? Uh, absolutely. Um, anything from schedule release to uh, new signings. Um, and, and right now we've got kind of a, a built-in uh, rumor mill with the uh, Pac-12 and the uh, Big 12 and the SEC kind of, everyone's just kind of realigning right now. And mm -hmm. you know, I think the Pac-12 and, and uh, Big 12 are meeting either yesterday or today, um, just, you know, kind of, kind of unique right now. So everyone's got some different rumors going on. Yeah. And you in your new role now uh, uh, have a bigger hand as the uh, West region manager now uh, for Learfield in all of those Pac-12 schools. That's got to be very juicy what's going on out there right now. How do you prepare your ticket sales folks to be up to date with current event stuff like that? You know, it's a, it's a good question. Um, in all reality, last year was kind of the perfect uh, test run for, for all of this, just because, you know, everyone's been operating the last 18 months with a sense of uncertainty. Um, and it's it's been unique. So right now, you know, we're just advising all of our sellers and, and uh, administrations that we partner with just to, um, if any of that sort of stuff comes on your traditional ticket call, just, you know, we know as much as you do that right now. And, and we're trying to, best partners that we can um, and allow the, the, the caller and the um, admins to, to pick our brain as much as possible and best practices, but really not a ton that we can provide from the whole realignment situation. All we can do is really be advisors and, and, and solution oriented when it comes to advising the, the fans to come to the games. So, Well, even from my time when I was, when I was managing a ticket sales team it's crazy the kinds of questions that you have to be prepared for on the phone so many times they're the front line when it comes to questions and it could be anything from free agent signings to what's your covid protocol in the building to uh what time do doors open i mean all that kind of stuff plays into how you guys have to be able to sell and, and they can't just be ticket sales they have to be customer service as well don't they and and that kind of leads me into i mean now that we're getting back to full capacity and, and Andrew I'll start with you because 
you guys had a couple of games at the very end where you were starting to allow fans back into the building. Uh, and now as you're preparing to, I would assume, be close to full capacity, I don't know, you can fill us in on what the Blackhawks might be doing there. How, how do you start to communicate those policies and fold that into the ticket sales conversation? Yeah, I, I think you just have to, you have to have contingencies ready and you have to be flexible. And we try to be as transparent as we can with our, with our fans and our customers. You know, there's a lot going on that's out of our hands. And as things develop, you just have to be prepared to, to pivot and, you know, to do what you need to do. But we are planning on, you know, playing in front of a full house, which we're super excited about. It's been, you know, since March of 20, since we've had that. So we all miss it. The fans miss it. Uh, we're ready to go. Yeah, the Madhouse is rocking, hopefully on Madison again here pretty soon. But uh, Ross, with you guys, I mean, is it going to vary between all of your spots, uh, uh, whether they're full capacity or not? Or are you thinking West Coast is going to be pretty much full capacity? Uh, I think, you know, fingers crossed, I think we're in a pretty good spot right now. Um, you know, I, I'm essentially pretty much any, everything west of uh, Houston. Um, and uh, so far, everything's been very positive news in terms of playing in front, in front of packed houses. So. Yeah, that's good. I mean, I think everybody needs that. Uh, you know, it's been too long. And, and um, for, for the livelihood of the business that we're talking about right now, ticket sales, uh, it'll be certainly uh, welcomed to see full capacity in most, of those, in most of those places. And it's interesting how through the pandemic, so much more emphasis was placed on kind of getting back to the basics of what this entire industry is, right? Is relationship building. When you have no tickets to sell, how do you build relationships with folks? And, and so I want to kind of hear from both of you guys as to what your strategy was when there were no tickets to sell last year. How do we utilize the platform that we have with our ticket sales AEs um, to, to still be able to add value to those fans. Ross, start with you. You were at Colorado at the time, overseeing a couple of other uh, um, uh, properties as well for Learfield. What was it like trying to prepare your AEs to say, hey, we still have to be out there making phone calls uh, and, and maybe not selling tickets, but at least providing information to our fans? Yeah, no, it was, uh, it was unique. Um, you know, we essentially become dis team discovery officers um, and try and really get a good understanding of why our fans were coming out in the first place and kind of build business plans around that um, so that when we did have our opportunity, you know, always offering the, the three options that became pretty much all three options that every school offered, which was that uh, refund, rollover, donate. Um, once we got a better understanding of why they were coming to our games, and this is a, a great opportunity to do that, um, because we, you know, quite frankly, didn't feel a ton of pressure to hit, you know, a revenue number because we had nothing to sell. So this was a great opportunity to learn why our fans were coming out and, and develop those relationships and have, you know, some best practices and some solutions um, that we can provide for the following year, um, which I think is a, a direct result that uh, we're seeing an industry standard of uh, renewal rates at a much higher rate uh, right now, just based off, I think people are we're doing their due diligence and, and getting a better understanding of why people were coming out to the games in the first place and adjusting their business plans. Um, and it also allowed our sellers to, to become creative. Uh, we were able to get a lot of virtual um, assets out there. You know, the, the eyes that were on screens were twofold more than ever before. And so it was a great opportunity to kind of shift our, our approach a little bit and get, have a little bit stronger of a digital approach. Um, and there's definitely some things that we're going to keep in the, in the toolbox, if you will, moving forward, because there was so much added value to it that, um, you know, it's a no brainer just to continue. So in all reality, there were some blessings around the whole thing that just allowed us to see things in a different scope. Absolutely. Andrew, piggyback off that for me. I want to know what you guys were doing, uh, creative content. Uh, obviously you guys, I'm sure have an outstanding creative shop there, uh, and what their, um, role was in the pandemic when it came to ticket sales and what you guys may have been putting out any suggestions for people as as they move into the post pandemic uh, uh, communication. Yeah, I think the most important step we took right off the bat is you know, we had, I believe, eight games that were canceled eight home games at the end of that season. So we went ahead and we bonused all of our customers 20% on that value. So at the very start, we said, listen, we appreciate your business. You know, we, we need you guys whenever we're back on the ice. 
and that was a really nice show of good faith to our to our customers, our core customers, and our fan base. Um, yeah, to piggyback off what Ross had spoken about, you know, that virtual piece was huge for us. I think, you know, one of my favorite events that we ran was uh, it was like a lunchtime kind of rivalry series. Um, we had Chris Chelios, Marion Hosa, uh, Dennis Savard. We had guys that were really ingrained in this Detroit Chicago rivalry. So we, you know, we basically set up a, a great conversation. They talked about games, stories, you know, head to head against certain players, you know, stuff that fans really don't get usually during a regular season. Mm -hmm. And, you know, was taking that, that content, was that exclusive content just for ticket sales or for uh, season ticket holders? It, it was. And nice. taking that a step further, you know, we want to build out models where we can trickle that down to the next customer, right? So yeah. is there a pay for play type situation that you want to put in, in place there? Do you filter that down to your partials, to your wait list? Perfect. So, you know, we're thinking about all that and it was, it was nice to have some, you know, freedom and platform to, to go and try some of those things. Yeah, I hope those kinds of things are going to stick around, right? I mean, is that, is that the plan with Blackhawks is to keep doing stuff like that? I would think so. I mean, exclusive content is, is the name of the game these days. I think we all know that. And, you know, people come to games, we have an incredible fan experience here, but I, I think the customer and the consumer really expects more than just, you know, coming to a game, you come in, you watch it, you head home, there's, there's so much value that we're trying to add and that you can add these days. And, you know, it's, it's unconventional. I think we've all kind of spun our creative wheels and we've come up with some really cool stuff. Yeah. Hey, you can check Andy, that off your, you go ahead, Ben. I was going to say, when you speak to customers or rather when you refer to customers, are you seeing a ratio of group ticket sales and individual ticket sales change at all? You know, is there more corporate selling? Um, I guess, how have you seen the differences there and, um, you know, what, what compared perhaps to pre COVID? Yeah, I, I think, I think the group business is still a little more difficult right now, just kind of getting people over that hump to, to feel comfortable to bring their super group out. Or, you know, if we had a group that drove a theme night, they haven't really been in that practice necessarily, where if they run a bunch of events and were part of their event schedule, a lot of that is kind of coming back online right now. So yeah. it's it's something that we're diving into as we speak. Um, I'd say we like probably- the name. People are like so cautious right. about the word group nowadays. You're like right. A group together is just like the name itself sounds weird now. <laughs> I think we've, we've had a, a mental shift, yeah. right? And for whatever reason, it's- you know, it's something that we need to be cognizant of because you really do need to sell people on the fact that it's safe to come out and do this again. So that's, that's at the heart of, you know, some of the communication that we're putting out there. For sure. And actually, yeah, I, would, I would actually agree I, in, in the sense that, you know, especially in, on the college side of things, there's, you know, a community feel with a lot of it um, and having those and leveraging those group experiences which are like high five tunnels traditionally for, for college athletics or high five tunnels and, and national anthems and, and halftime performances and, and like the mini games that you guys have going on uh, on TV timeouts and that sort of stuff. And that's where we're, you know, where we are seeing as an industry standard some, some difficulties because we're not exactly sure how we can be leveraging these group experiences anymore, um, specifically with just player safety and, and access to um, inside the facility, quote unquote, right behind the scenes. Um, you know, we're trying to operate in a bubble as much as possible while still being on a public campus sometimes is, is a unique situation. Yeah. yeah, sure. And it goes back to that whole added value that, right, you can check that off your bingo card. Andrew said it in the last question is that added value. Everybody's trying to figure out what can you do to provide a level up from just here's a ticket, here's your seat, go sit down. Um, and so there, there's so much information, I think, that has to be passed now to the customer uh, that maybe sometimes it can feel like overload. I don't know. I, I want to know how you guys strike a balance as to how much information you push and what channels do you guys feel like have the most success when we really talk about getting into the sales process and the sales cycle uh, for ticket sales? Does it start with a phone call? Are you guys, you know, smile and dial guys? Or is it more, hey, let's, let's figure out how we can incorporate emails or text messages or social media to, to enhance our strategy. Ross, go first. Give me what you got. 
Um, you know, I think a lot of it is based off of the demographic and where and where your team's going to be located. Um, you know, we are seeing, you know, especially on the college side, you're going to have two very, very different demographics. You're going to have your very traditional college football fans, um, and then you're going to have your, your metropolitan uh, demographics that are a little bit more tech savvy and a little bit more open to some, some different changes. Um, I think, you know, for from us, I've always been a call first person um, and, and get a better understanding of who's buying and then follow up with an email um, or social touch points. Because again, what, what good, at least in my opinion, what good is an email or, or a, a social push if you don't really know who you're targeting and why? Um, you know, at that point, it just becomes a little bit more of a spray and pray method. Um, and, you know, let, let's have a little bit more of, a, of a, a tailored approach and get a better understanding of who's coming to the games and why, and then let's serve them the appropriate ads or let's send them the appropriate email. So that way we're, um, you know, working that funnel, that sales funnel and, and, and picking the low hanging fruit and growing the business from the inside out. Yeah. Andrew, with you, same way. I mean, is it always leading with a phone call from the Blackhawks before any sort of communication goes out? Uh, it, I guess start with season ticket holders and then maybe talk about what you're doing uh, for, a, for a single game. Yeah, I mean, we, we try. Obviously, we try to get on the phones and, and lead. I think, you know, old school thinking that that conversation is super important. It always will be a big part of our, of our strategy when it comes to outreach and communication. We do have a brand new business strategy and analytics team that is, is doing big things over here and, you know, supporting our efforts. So at the end of the day, I mean, we would love to be in a spot where we can identify by ticket holder you know, what's the best way they like to communicate, right? Things like that. And then to Ross's point, I think you really need to understand who the customer is and the products that they're most interested in. That will also dictate your strategy in terms of, you know, trying to get that initial connection before you even get into the sales pitch and, and some of those discussions. With, well, and, with and, either of yeah. you guys, do you have specific, and I, I feel like I ask the same question or a version of it every time. Do you have specific tools that you used to measure the success of different approaches, um, specifically like social, it just it, like, that's the big thing we constantly hear in recruiting, like, hey, we're spending all this time and money on all these different resources, marketing, videos, graphics, but there's so many, there's so little tools that they have that actually measures what's working, and what's not. Um, do you guys specifically have some tools that you could perhaps either share with us or or you know specific strategy you use to measure that. Yeah, I, I can I can jump in. Um, much like you know Andrew said, is that we you know, we have a we have a data analytics team as well. Um, depending on if you're on campus or we actually have a, a hub of them as well that oversees some different properties all within one uh, setting. But um, you know we we do partner with some third different uh, third party uh, partnerships that are allowed for some marketing automation and better understanding of um, you know targeted ads. Um, and just product knowledge within within the consumer um, and having a better understanding of when they're opening up emails and what emails they're opening up um, at different timelines and, and you know then lead scoring based off of how fast they're renewing, how fast they're buying uh, tickets and, and just having a better understanding of that person's history um, and overall want uh, to come to games and, and that's all done through transaction histories and, and kind of a digital footprint that is left wherever we go um, and just having a better understanding of how to reach out to those people so um, to answer your question yes we do have tools a lot of it is um, plug and play situations but at the same time you know I, I don't think you'll ever get back or you'll ever lose that traditional you know hand-to-hand -hand combat in terms of getting a better understanding of who we're calling as well yeah Awesome. Is that is that data and analytics team that you um, mentioned, Andrew? I mean, is that kind of industry standard now in in the professional sports realm? And uh, go more in depth, I think, if you could, without giving too many trade secrets uh, on kind of how they're helping you on the ticket sales side. Yeah, I, I think I think it is. And honestly, for us, you know, it's it's been a huge transition for some of the folks like myself who have been here for a long time, and you know that definitely didn't play a big enough part in what we had done over the years. Um, I, I think now more than ever, that group is going to give us the tools we need to increase revenue and, and to improve our business. So, you know, our top rep, for example, most of the sales, at least full season sales that he's uh, converted over the course of, you know, this stretch where we weren't on the ice, 
it may take 10 to 15 touch points before we close that sale. The more data that we can pump into their models that they're building for us, that's just going to improve our strategy and our process. So, you know, I'm learning, I'm learning new things every day. A good example is, you know, any, be it a tweet, be it a social post that includes ticketing messaging, the engagement on that is typically lower than, you know, just a, a straight content piece. So right. things like that, you know, we want to get our message out there and use those channels and leverage that. But there's other parts of the organization, of course, that want to do other things and accomplish their goals. So mm -hmm. it really is a team effort and understanding, you know, how we leverage those to make everyone happy and, you know, to accomplish our, our greater goals as an organization. And that's premium real estate, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Feeding, man. I mean, I, I think people, I think if you peel back the curtain, I think some people just think, oh, you can just throw a tweet out whenever you want and, and say whatever you want on and look at Ross shaking his head already like, no way. <laughs> Anybody who's been in an athletics organization or a professional sports organization knows that, that your marketing department, man, or your, your, uh, your communications department, they hold the keys to that Twitter handle uh, really tightly. You can't just throw a tickets tweet out whenever you want. So to, to your point, Andrew, man, when you, when you get that chance, you got to make it count, right? That's right. Yeah. I mean, uh, just on that real quick, you know, I think, I think it, it, it comes back to the sense that we're trying to, we're trying to keep a, a value in a certain, in a certain brand. Um, and, you know, I think there's a, there's a, a thought process is no one wants to actually be sold on anything. And I think yeah. a lot of people get pride on, on the fact that, oh, I can't get sold. <laughs> and, and, you know, I think, I think you got to have to kind of lean into that. And, and that's where you're, where you're kind of figuring out what's going to be a better social campaign. Is it going to be more of a, of a brand facing um, situation with a friendly nudge? to go, uh, you know, a strong suggestion uh, to go buy tickets rather than just a straight up ask. I think there's going to be a time and place for both, but in terms of managing that brand and, and keeping that stigma of, I don't ever want to be sold. I think you got to kind of have to find that friendly balance between those friendly nudges as well. Are you guys seeing this more and more? You tell me, I see this all the time now on social, right? Is they, it's a hype video it's and the captions got nothing to do with ticket sales right but the greatest thing that for ticket sales managers that was ever created was that little ticket stub emoji where every tweet is tagged with that little ticket stub emoji and then the link to buy the tickets but the content itself ross to your point says nothing about ticket sales yeah. so i think that's what you're alluding to right is how do you how do you strike uh, a a balance between providing the content that resonates to ben's point and folding in Andrew's business and analytics. Okay. Well, if that's what's striking, if that's what's resonating, that's getting the most eyeballs. How do we still figure out a way to leverage this into revenue? You know? Absolutely. I mean, that's where, that's where the whole process comes together. And that's why this is such a, a, a puzzle, you know, to put together it, ticket sales is not just smile and dial anymore. While it's, it's, there's, there's a formula to this. So What's the, when you guys get into the, the sales cycle and you, Andrew said 15 touch points sometimes to be able to, to get your message across. I mean, how many channels are you hitting up? Is it, is it the phone call? Is it the emails? Are you utilizing text messages at all nowadays to be able to, to really make a more well-rounded strategy? Absolutely. I mean, you know, we, we really empower our reps to run their own books and, I think the reps that leverage the three major tools, you know, phone, email, text are the ones that do the best. Um, you know, my top rep, he, he kind of runs his own business within the Blackhawks book. Obviously, you know, we talk strategy. We all have, you know, our regulations from rep to rep, not stepping on each other's toes, of course. But, you know, that's I'm going to give some uh, leeway, I guess you'd say, to the rep that's pushing the envelope. Right. So I love that. I think that's, that's great. Yeah. And that's, that's how it needs to be. And, you know, we want them to learn as they go. I want him to be a manager and director and hopefully it's here. It might be somewhere else, but that's, that's why we do this. Right. I mean, it's about our people at the end of the day. So that's, that's the way I look at it. I try to, I try to run it that way. That's great. I mean, so you're just providing them with the tools to, to, to be successful, run their own business. I love the way you put that. Um, and I mean, I'm sure that turns into success and Ross, you're shaking your head the whole time. So he's preaching to the choir here, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, you know, we're process minded, 
um, and, and having a, the, the right idea of how and where and when to use these tools. Uh, it just, it just happens naturally and, and the, and the leaders within the, the organizations rise to the top naturally, just because they're, they, I think they see it, uh, from that same 30,000 foot scope. Um, but at the same time, you know, we will use our, our tools for, for different campaigns as well. If we know we're, we're sitting, we're hitting a certain demographic for young alumni, you know, they obviously respond better to, to, to text messages and social. Um, and if, you know, we're reaching out to the maybe 60 plus, it's going to be more of your, your traditional handwritten notes sometimes, you know, they really appreciate <laughs> that as well. Um, and a, a traditional phone call. So I, I think it really just depends on, on what campaign you're working on, when and where. Well, let me piggyback off of that, uh, Ross, because I wanted to kind of, as we wrap up our conversation here, um, one of the big things that I wanted to talk so much about, because even just last year when I was still in an athletic department working with tickets in my role uh, as DOD, mobile ticketing with COVID and everything else, we were having the conversation before, but now with mobile ticketing, I mean, it has to be going through the roof, right? The, the rise in mobile ticketing. How do you think the, that 60 plus group, that demographic has to be now adapting. So while the handwritten note might still work, do you feel like they're starting to come around to some of those other forms of communication, text messages, emails, more digital communication, because the, the industry is forcing them to adapt to something like mobile ticketing? Yeah, um, at least from the college side, you know, the NFL uh, ripped the Band-Aid off for us uh, a lot uh, in a lot of our major markets. Um, so there was a little bit of a learning curve that we fortunately didn't have to go through um, with some of our fans with, with that shared, um, you know, location if they had an NFL team within driving distance from their, from their college team. But um, yeah, I mean, around the country, we are, we're having to put how-to videos out there. Um, one of the top questions that we are being, that we're asking right now is, are you an Android or Apple user? Um, so that way we can help them, you know, learn how to use their, their digital their digital wallet. A lot of times they don't know they have it and how easy it can actually be uh, just hitting that side button three times. All of a sudden your tickets are here. Um, and it's as simple as that. So a lot of our schools have put out how-to videos and have leveraged uh, actually MMR um, from it as well. You know, um, how to get your, your uh, mobile tickets sponsored by XYZ company. Yeah. And it will be our actual... Uh, play-by-play -play, uh, announcer, you know, kind of making it a, a fun, cheeky way of, you know, opens up the app and kind of play-by-play -play on how to actually get these uh, mobile tickets. And, you know, that kind of ties into everything that we've talked about from the digital, from the from the marketing piece, from the, the social piece on getting back to that generic hand-to-hand -hand exchange, you know, it's no longer going to be the case anymore. So I think, you know, it's just going to be product knowledge and, and, and trying to over-communicate as much as possible. I, I love that turning a uh, turning a pain point into a sellable asset is that's innovation. That's that's strong business. So, we yeah we go through that. You know it's been some years now since we went away from hard copy tickets, and right. we had some beauties over the years. You know Winter Classic. Uh, you know I, I'm yeah, call me a ticket nerd, whatever. I I like the hard copy ticket, so I get it. But you know the trade off for what we get. And really that frictionless experience and a better user experience at the end of the day, especially as we start to build more technology into the app, you know, in-game offers, uh, discounts, rewards, gifts, all these things you can do. I, I think the customer is missing out by not being a part of that. So, you know, it, it's also the way the world is changing. Everybody, you know, to kind of get through day to day these days, you have to, you have to engage in this technology. Yeah, and, and the, the pain at the front has to be outweighed by the reward on the back end. Right. To your point, Andrew, the more people get comfortable with the app or receiving, receiving mobile tickets, the more comfortable they become with dealing with a push notification on the app or getting a text message with an offer or any of those kinds of things where now you're right, you're, you are, you are um, conditioning them that, hey, we're, we're coming straight to your mobile phone now with any communication that you need from us, you're going to find it right here. 
Uh, and, and hopefully as, as those trends continue, it becomes even easier for folks because to your point, I, I think it's the way that we go. I mean, I don't know if there's any way to go back. I think you're just going to have to get your commemorative tickets. Uh, you, first 10,000 through the door, Andrew, you're just going to have to get them that way, I think, from now on, which is sad. But I mean, yeah. do you have them hanging all up in your office or at home? What do you got? The, I, the- don't, I, don't, I don't go that far. They're, in a, oh. they're probably in a drawer somewhere. But, <laughs> you know, it, it, it kind of it brings you back to the memory of being there it really does when you look at it. And, you know, that's something that you can't replace, but again, do the benefits outweigh, you know, replacing that. I, I think, I think it's a resounding yes. And, and well, now, you, the- now you start thinking about, all right, from a user experience, how do we bring that memory back to them? A push notification of you taking a selfie at that game. Like now it's like a completely different, how can we we give you that same memory experience without that that physical ticket? It right. yeah, it, it changes that's, everything. That's a great point, and that's that's part of what our service team is tasked to do. You know, if they talk about the Disney experience, where yeah. you know you can you can buy everything there, and there's packages and so many levels, right? You need to be very strategic about how you build that, but sure. you want to be able to add on in the experience and take something more away and you know, we're, we're trying to figure that out on a daily basis. That's great. But I mean, at the end of the day, that's why, that's why you guys are in the business that you're in, right. Is, is to provide fans with that experience. I think that's a great uh, uh, way for us to wrap up this conversation is, is kind of how, how do you overall, your, your, your thoughts, your, your uh, concept on your, um, I guess, philosophy on how do we still, stick to what we're good at and what our purpose is in this larger ecosystem of our organization, which is at the end of the day, provide the fan with that life-changing or memorable, a memorable experience. I mean, how, how do you guys try and convey that to your AEs or your, your ticket sales managers, either one of you guys, I'd open it up. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to goosebump moments, right? You know, and, and it goes two ways. One, uh, providing that for the fans, and that comes with just providing the best overall customer experience and then letting your product do the job for you. I mean, I, I, it's, it's unique. Just if you don't overcomplicate things and allow, you know, and, and, but still be on, it's a fine line to walk. You don't want to overcomplicate things, but at the same time, still want to be on that cutting edge experience uh, without overwhelming the, the buyer experience. And, and so I think that you have to kind of be strategic on that, but then it goes vice versa as to why we're in this as well. All the AEs that grind in you know, the dog days of summer, at least for college and, and uh, trying to fill stadiums. And then you have that one moment on kickoff um, right, right before kickoff and the fans are shaking their car keys. And all of a sudden you get that goosebump moment. You know, like Colorado is watching Ralphie run. Um, and, and it's just, it reminds you why you're here and, and seeing everybody cheer and, and put all of their stress and worries from the work day behind them and just kind of have a three hour period of just, they can take stock in something that's bigger than them and, and not have a ton of um, say in, in how things go, I think is just kind of how, you know, what, what that memory, you know, at least sparks a passion for uh, the average person. And I think it's, it's super contagious. And if you can, paint that picture over the phone, uh, you're going to do quite well in the industry. Yeah. Yeah, I would. I totally agree. You know, we have some unique elements, especially with our game presentation here at the UC with the Hawks, with, you know, the anthem, it's a one of a kind, you know, feeling and experience that if you've, you've never been a part of it, you need to see it. And when we get new fans in here, they they can't, they can't really even put their finger on it because it's such a cool moment. So, you know, things like that, you're selling an experience. You're not, really selling a product at the end of the day. We have a great market here. We have people that have money to spend. So, you know, there's, there's endless opportunity, but I think those, those moments are really, you know, those are campaigns that we built in the past and, and that's what you try to hit on and play off of. And then we try to, you know, if you have value platforms and rewards and things like that, you want to put, you want to put the keys in the customer's hands to, have the opportunity to, to drive value for what they want, right? Yeah. You can do gifts and experiences and, you know, build a platform a certain way, but we're trying to tailor that to the specific customer so that that person can choose what works for them that, you know, will help them renew or buy more. 
Well said, guys. Gosh, I mean, you talk about those goosebump moments. I don't know if there's a bigger goosebump moment than than the national anthem at a Blackhawks game. Uh, so, so that's a, that's a good one to uh, to take us out on. Andrew Ross, we unpacked a ton of stuff today. Thank you both so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it. I think everybody who's going to listen to this is going to get some great value uh, to take back to their teams and their organizations. So again, guys, thank you so much for joining us. Yep, those are great, guys. Thanks for having yeah. me. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Take care. Yeah.